Grace and peace be unto you. I am Minister Rakita La Allen, an associate minister here at the Convent Avenue Baptist Church. I greet you with the joy of Jesus Christ, my Savior. I am grateful to be able to share with you in this Bible study. But before we get started, I have to take a few moments and acknowledge a few people. First, our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Jesse T. Williams, Jr., who has allowed me to serve in this capacity. Thank you, sir. Next, Reverend Marie Mike, who so graciously asked that I would join the wonderful group of ministers in celebrating Women's Month this month. We had wonderful presentations from Minister Tina Young, Minister Regina Ailes, and Minister Gail Parker. And I pray that we will continue to be blessed as we go forward today. I have been tasked with sharing from the Old Testament story of the Shunammite woman. Her story is found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 37. And we see her again in 2 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. I will be sharing today's story in the voice of the Shunammite woman. A few moments of artistic license so that the story will go smoothly. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, you have been so good to us. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to sit and to be in Bible study yet again. Thank you, God, for another Women's Month. Thank you, Lord, for all that women's ministry means here at the Convent Avenue Baptist Church and beyond. We pray now, Lord, that you would anoint us. We pray that you would give us clarity of speech and help, O oh God, your spirit to move both in and through us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, for you are my strength. You are my redeemer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Shalom. I am the Shunammite woman. Not the Shunammite woman, wife of my husband, but simply the Shunammite woman. Like many of the women in our holy writ, I am unnamed. Many of us are named by our condition, the woman with the issue of blood, our circumstance, the woman with the alabaster box, or like me, we are known by our village. My village of Shunem is among the tribe of Issachar. Shunem is near Jezreel and north of Mount Gilboa. And even though I am only known by my village, I feel like I am familiar to you even today. I am like the women of today who we know by their deeds. The women who give out candy to church members before service or the women who sit in the window and watch the goings on in the neighborhood. I am like the women who are given to hospitality both at the doors of the church and at home hospitality. My heart for hospitality is actually what started this story. I am also a woman of means. That means I am wealthy and I have my own money. I am blessed to have a husband is okay with my money and we have done well for ourselves. Back to hospitality. Hospitality was extremely important in our day. So much of our travel was done in desert situations and there was no ready accommodations. We didn't have hotels. We didn't have bed and breakfast in our day. In fact, travelers would enter the town at the center and wait. They would remain near the town gates and wait for someone to give them an invitation for the night. If no one offered an invitation, then travelers were allowed and in fact forced to sleep 
outside under the night stars. So many things, so many dangers could befall you in town after nightfall. One could fall prey to robbers. One could fall prey to people who were seeking to do harm to strangers. So it was a wonderful thing to be hospitable. Agreeing to host someone meant that we were responsible for their meals, their lodging, and we were also responsible for their safety. Once a guest was taken into someone's home, they were provided with water to bathe and refresh their feet and a meal. As a host, our home was to ensure that the guest was protected. Protected from robbery or any harm that would come to any guest. Guests were offered the best and largest parts of the meal and we were given to give them preferential treatment over ourselves. Hospitality was important, and I was glad and honored to serve in this way. I would consistently watch travelers as they went from Nazareth to Jerusalem. Remember, I was like the women who watch in the neighborhood. It was during these times that I noticed the prophet Elisha. Elisha was passing through town and I noticed that his trips were frequent. So after some time of seeing him, I began to ask him to have a meal with my husband and I. We would dine in fellowship. It was during one of these trips that I discerned that this was a holy man working for God. So I said to my husband, I am pretty sure that this man who keeps passing by this way is a holy man of God. Let us make him a chamber on our roof and give him a chair and a table and a bed. Let us put a lamp so that he can stay there whenever he comes to visit us. Please understand that building this room meant an addition on our house. We built a room for him on our roof so that he could come and go as he needed. This room would give him a chance to study, to rest, to refresh himself as he went about the Lord's work. This room would give him a place for intimate worship of Yahweh. My husband agreed and we built the room. One day when Elisha came to visit and went into his room, his servant Gehazi was with him. Elisha asked Gehazi to summon me. And so once I came into the room, Elisha said to me, you have taken such good care of us. What can we do for you? Would you like for us to speak to the king on your behalf? Maybe a word to the commander of the army. Doing this would have allowed us to move into a different, more affluent part of town. If the prophet had spoken to the king on our behalf, we would have been able to move and to be in a more, shall we say, prestigious area and live among kings. Speaking to the commander of armies would have guaranteed our protection. It would have been a different way of life. I explained, however, that I was pleased to dwell among my own people. I dwell among my own people. Thank you, sir, but I am good here with my people. And then I left. He seemed to have continued his discussion about what should be done for me in my absence because he summoned me to his door yet again. This time, 
when he asked what could be done to repay me, his servant Gehazi made note of the fact that I had no children, and my husband was old. Elisha immediately prophesied to me, this time next year, you will embrace a son. Now, I had made my peace with not having a child. I had come to an understanding with myself that this was the way of Jehovah. Me not having a child even in my wealthy state, brought shame to me. As an Israelite woman, it was our responsibility to produce a male heir. But I had laid those dreams to rest. I had made peace with no pitter-patter of little feet and no diapers. I'm going to say that I also had to come to terms with some deep shame around the fact that I had not produced an heir for my husband. My husband was old and I'm not exactly the youngest woman either. So I said to Elijah, nay, my Lord, do not deceive thy handmaiden. We gave you the room because we understand that you are a holy man of God. I didn't want to get my hopes up. I didn't want to get excited about something that hitherto had been impossible and had not happened. We didn't make the room for you so that you would promise us a son. We were obedient to the leading of Yahweh. After our conversation, I returned to my chores and I put babies out of my head. I didn't dwell on that prophecy. I put the whole thing out of my head and went on about my life. It happened, just like Elijah said, around the same time the next year, we welcomed our miracle baby boy. The dream I didn't even know I had became a reality. It was true, I had a baby. He became the joy of our hearts, our personal gift. Elijah prophesied, and we were the beneficiaries of his prophecy coming true. Our beautiful baby boy, praise Jehovah. He entered our lives with a squall, and he awakened a love in me that I had never known. I couldn't stop looking at his little feet and his little head and I couldn't stop looking at his hands and his fingers and I couldn't stop watching him as he wiggled. I had a baby boy. I couldn't stop marveling at the fact that I was a mother and I had finally fulfilled my purpose as an Israelite woman and given my husband an heir. Our family name would live on. All praise to Yahweh. <sighs> Our baby boy. Several years passed and my wonderful son, the joy of our lives was in the field with his father and the reapers. He said to his father, oh, my head, my head. And in typical father fashion, my husband told our servant, take him to his mother. The servant brought our baby boy in. By now he was 12 or 11. He wasn't a baby anymore, but you know how mothers are. He, he's always gonna be my baby. The servant brought him in and I sat him on my lap to nurse him and to make him feel better. You know, mothers, we have a way we can rock our sons. And so he sat on my lap and at noon, he died. 
my gorgeous baby boy, my prophecy fulfilled, died. He died in my arms. Once I realized he was actually dead, I took him to the prophet Elijah's room and I laid him on the bed and I closed the door. I did not tell anyone that my baby, my son, my precious gift was dead. I'm not sure that I even understood it myself. God had given me a promise and now it's gone? No, this can't be. It can't be that he's dead. I, I, I could barely breathe. I could barely think straight. But I knew immediately what I had to do. I had to get to Elisha. And I had to get there and back before the spirit disconnected from his body. You see, in our faith tradition, when someone dies, the spirit hovers, though unattached, for three days. And after three days, the spirit moves on. So if, 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 if we could get back, if I could get to Elisha and something could be done, maybe, just maybe, maybe, just maybe, he could help my boy. I had to get to Elisha. I didn't break down. I didn't curse God. I just resolved that I had to get to Mount Carmel where Elisha was. I had to get there. So after I laid our promise on the bed, I went to the door and called to my husband who was in the field. Send me a servant and one of the donkeys. I need to go to the man of God and come back again. My husband had no idea that I had just laid our dead boy in Elisha's bed, but he knew something was different. You know, husbands know their wives, and he knew that I was a little off. You don't usually go to the man of God unless it is the Sabbath or a new moon. How is it that you are going today? Are you okay? Is everything okay? I took a deep breath. I kept my face still. It will be all right. I must go to Elijah. It shall be well. I had no idea how it would be all right. I had no idea what God was going to do, but I understood that if I could get to Elisha, that it would somehow be all right. Looking back on it now, I can say that there are times that our faith drives us without even being aware. It was faith that made me determined to get to the prophet. Or maybe it was that I had heard that he had done something similar for another widow who had lost her son. Maybe it was that I don't know what it was. I don't know. I don't understand why. But I knew that if I got there to him, that something could be done for my baby. So the servant pulls up to the house, and I saddle the donkey, and I gather my skirt, and I tighten my rep, and I tell the servant, do not slack unless I tell you to. Go quickly. The servant looked and understood that this was an urgent matter. And so, as fast as we could travel that day, we traveled. You see, it was 20 miles 
roughly 20 miles between Shunem and Mount Carmel. And we only had donkeys going against desert travel. Today, 20 miles is what? 10 minutes, 20 minutes? Not fast, not far. You can go far and fast today, but then where Elisha lived, it was a day's journey. And it was at least a day's ride going back. And remember, I was trying to get there and because we, in my mind, we only had three days for something to be done and this travel was a considerable amount of time but I knew that if we rushed, that if we pressed our way, that perhaps we could get there. You see, like I said, sometimes our faith moves us and compels us even in ways that confuse us. I just knew I had to get there. We arrive at Mount Carmel and Elisha, Elisha he spots me coming from afar off. He then sends Gehazi to meet me. Does Gehazi ask, is everything all right? How is your son? How is your husband? How are you? I responded again, all is well. I had no interest in talking to anyone other than Elisha. I didn't want to talk to him in particular because it was his notice that got us in this condition. He was the one who told Elisha I didn't have a son. I didn't want to talk to him. I wanted to talk to the man of God. Think about it. When you have something on your heart, when something is burdened and tragic and traumatizing, you don't want to talk to anyone but the one in charge. You don't want to talk to the people who sit at the front desk. You want to talk to the boss. So I needed to speak to Elisha. I needed him to do some explaining. I had held it together relatively well, but when I got to him, I fell at his feet and I came completely, completely undone. I fell at his feet and I was just so distressed. My baby, oh my baby. Because I tried to pull me away from Elisha's feet, but Elisha said to him, let her be. She is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me. You bet I was in deep distress. My baby was dead. Did I ask my Lord for a son? Didn't I ask you not to deceive me? <laughs> I was okay, <laughs> and you promised me this, son. And now, <laughs> my son is dead. Did I ask you? Did I not say nay, my Lord? Do not deceive thy handmaiden. My son. Elisha says to Gehazi, gird up your loins and take my staff in your hand and go to the boy. Do not slack. Do not speak to anyone. And if anyone speaks to you, do not answer them. Go and lay the staff on the face of the child. Well, I thought that was nice. And I was grateful that Gehazi was going to see if he could help my baby. However, I was not leaving Elisha. My response to him was, as the Lord lives and as sure as you live, I will not go anywhere 
without you. You are the one who got me in this situation, and you have got to get me out. I'm not leaving without you. Now, I told you earlier that I should feel a bit familiar. How many mothers out there would have been as convinced as I was about the prophet going to see your baby? How many, if given the opportunity to be at the prophet's feet and know that he could change your circumstance, would not have acted in the same way that I did. I wasn't leaving. I needed to be with Elisha, and I needed him to understand that I was only going to move when he did. Gehazi went ahead of us and did as Elisha instructed. And my son did not wake up. There was no sound or sign of life. Gehazi met us as we were coming up to my home. And he told us, the child has not awakened. And I thought, that's because Elisha made the promise, not you. Elisha prophesied this child. You serve Elisha. So no, he is not waking up. Elisha got to my home and went into the room with my son. And then he put me out. He put me out. He wouldn't let me stay in the room with my boy. And he put out his faithful servant, his right hand. Gehazi and I were locked out of the room. Looking back, I wonder why I couldn't stay in the room. I wonder why. He said, you and Gehazi must leave. I think it was because he needed the time with Yahweh. I think it was because he needed to entreat Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. And my emotion might have gotten in the way of his communication. Sometimes when we're in distress, the only recourse is for us to shut out everything and begin to entreat our God to talk to God without interference and to believe that God will move on our behalf. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. I, I, I think that's why he put me out of the room. It was just the two of them in there, but I was outside the room listening in. I heard Elisha pray to Yahweh. And then I heard him walk around the room. The story goes that he laid upon my boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, and hands to hands. And then he walked around the room. That's how the story is written. He walked around the room. Perhaps that was when I heard his footsteps. And then he bent over my boy again. And then I heard the most beautiful sound my ears have ever heard to this day. My son sneezed. Hachoo! 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 Seven times he sneezed. And then he opened his eyes. My son was alive. 
and breathing. He sneezed seven times. Seven times represents the number of completion. The work of Yahweh was completed. God healed my son. Praise it be to Jehovah, the Lord God who heals. The Lord God who gives wind. The Lord God who is the breath, the pneuma. We bless you, God. Thank you for saving my son. Thank you for breathing life into my boy. Oh God, we bless you and we give you glory. You are worthy, Lord. My son was alive. God, Isaiah called me to Elisha and went to the, and I went to the room, he said, Take your son. And I fell at his feet. And I worshiped our God. I worshiped our God. You see, Elisha prophesied, but God fulfilled the prophecy. And Elisha understood that God was the one who would keep the promise that God was the one, that Jehovah was the one who would see to it that my boy lived, which is why he prayed and why he put me out. Back to seven, it was the completed work and I realized that Elisha was the instrument used by God that Elisha was the instrument who prophesied. Just like Gehazi served Elisha, Elisha served Yahweh. And Yahweh kept the promise. It was God who resurrected my boy from the dead. God who heard the cries of my heart. And as I lay at the feet asking, when I was at the feet of Elijah, how could you deceive me? It was Jehovah who heard me. <laughs> we began our time together with lessons from me. And so here are a few lessons that I'd like to leave with you, if I may. God rewarded my service and my hospitality as I was moved to serve the prophet with hospitality and care. God rewarded us with a son. And God rewarded us with a kept promise. May I say to you today, my friends, that serving God is still rewarded with the promise of God's presence. He sees all and God will record all that we do and give us gifts and bless us according to his will. God still rewards us for service. The next lesson I learned is that God still sustains faith. God got me out of that house. God allowed me to tell my husband where I was going and sustained me on the journey to Mount Carmel. All the while declaring all is well. That was my faith talking. It was Jehovah that kept me from losing my mind. Jehovah, the God who sustains. God sustained my faith. And I say to you, friends, that God is still sustaining our faith. We need but put our faith in him. My last lesson is that God answers our prayers. Praise be 
to God. God answered the prayers of Elisha. Elisha understood that God was the healer and he prayed to God. God changes situations. Jehovah restores life to dead things. Did you hear me, friends? Jehovah is still restoring life to dead things. Dust off some of those dead dreams and aspirations and lay them before God. Go back and look at some of the things you have aspired and dreamed of doing and you let the dream die. Revisit the hopes that you have pushed away and hope again because Jehovah still answers prayer. God, we thank you for answering prayer. Thank you, God, for hearing and answering prayer, both then and now. Thank you, great Jehovah. We honor you and we are glad. Bless your name, Jehovah. Bless your name. You answer prayer. My story isn't quite over. <laughs> A famine comes to the village of Shunem, and Elisha once again gives me a word that I have to leave for a period of seven years. And so, given our history, I obey the prophet and I leave my home. I leave our land to find refuge in the land of the Philistines. I find refuge, remember the commander of the armies? <laughs> I find refuge with the commander of the armies in the land of the Philistines because of their ability to protect me and my son. So we stay there for seven years. And once the famine is over, I return home and discover that my land has been seized, presumably to the crown, to the king. And I realize that I must make an appeal to the king for my own land. As I am approaching the king, because you know I have a history of going, and so if I must have my land back, I'm going to speak to the king. As I am approaching the king, Gehazi is talking about the deeds of Elisha. He has shared with my, he has shared with the king that my son is in fact the one that Elisha raised from the dead. They're still talking about it seven years later. The king saw my son in the flesh and after asking me a few questions, he appointed an official for me with the order that I would receive my land, as well as the increase from the land over the seven years. Seven years, once again, the work was completed. God had protected my land for seven years, and that time of famine is completed. It's over. It was time for me to go back home. And over the years, my land made money. There was increase because I had so much land. And the king required that they give me the increase over all seven years. They had to restore my ancestral homes and they had to give the land back to me. The land that was now heirred and betrothed to my son. Do you see, do you see how God blessed me with a son and an heir? And after seven years, I got our land. God gave us our land. My husband had died by then. My son 
the son that died and God resurrected him from the dead. My son is the heir. God be praised. Lastly, I would like to remind anyone that is tuned in today that the same resurrection power that raised my son lives in us today. Whenever we need God, God's power lives in us today. Whenever we need healing, Jehovah Rapha is healing today. Whenever we need peace, Jehovah Shalom is our peace. God promised us a savior. And in promising us a savior, God not only gave us a promise, a sustainer that gave us new life, God gave us a God, a savior who lives today. Our Savior lives today. The resurrecting power that resurrected my boy resurrected Jesus Christ. And he lives today. And he heals the brokenhearted. He lives today. And he carries us through every storm. He lives today. He sees about us. He lives today. He is still making a way out of no way. Our God, Jehovah, is still God. And God will always be God. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Praise be to Jehovah. Shalom.